Hey guys, Modeling Weekly here. For my first proper build video in a long while, I've decided to take on the behemoth that is Ravel's 148th scale Junkers Ju-52 transport aircraft, which measures in with a whopping wingspan of around 2 feet. This is definitely going to be a challenging build, and a long one at that, so let's get into the video. Before we do get into the build, I thought I'd just take this moment to make the big announcement of my all new merch store. It's been in the works for quite a while now, but I'm at last happy to release it for you guys. As you can see in the video, it's hosted over on Redbubble, so all of the products feature a very nice print quality and resist wear and tear nicely. You can reach by either searching MW Official on Redbubble or heading to modelingweekly.co.uk, which will redirect you to my storefront. I try to make the designs as universally appealing as possible with a bunch of different stuff to choose from. Bear in mind that these items that are displayed are simply previews, as you can actually apply each design to around 40 different items. If you have used Redbubble before, you'll know what I mean. I really hope you guys like this, and if the response is good, I'll work on even more designs for the future. With that said, let's get back into the video. This kit was actually built for and supplied by my tech teacher and her son Archie, as she has helped me out so much in the past couple of years, so this was a great way of saying thanks. So Archie, if you're watching, sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoyed this video. Included in the box of the kit is of course the plastic, which is all packed into a single plastic bag. It's also white, which is a little bit weird, though I'm sure this won't be too much of an issue. You also get separately packed clear plastic parts, as well as the decals and instruction booklet. The plastic itself, which was tooled back in 1998, really isn't bad at all for its age. There are a few areas where detail is missing, though overall the panel lines are crisply recessed and the corrugated surface effect is well captured. There are a few oddities here and there, including a raised Ravel logo on the underside that needed to be sanded down flush. Despite being a bit of a speed bump, this was perfectly easy to do with a few sanding sticks though. The clear plastic parts themselves are actually quite nice, with perfectly raised details showing where to place masks and where to cut them. The main panels are also very clear with no scratches or any flaws, I've definitely seen a lot worse. As with all aircraft kits, this build started in the cockpit and interior, which in this kit was pretty extensive as you can imagine. There weren't too many small pieces though, so it wasn't too bad. All plastic parts were fixed with Tamiya Extra Thin Cement, as per usual. You might be able to see in a few shots here and there that there are quite a lot of ejector pin marks in the walls. I wasn't too fussed about this though, as you won't be able to see them once the interior is all sealed up. The more painstaking among you may choose to fill them, however, which may prove difficult due to the corrugated texture. Despite being a little bit off in terms of tone, Tamiya Olive Drab was used to paint the interior. It's actually quite funny, as the new formula for Tamiya's Olive Drab is terrible as an actual OD, but pretty good as an interior green in this case. I sprayed it straight onto the plastic, as it's white and would not affect the tone of the paint drastically at all. I'd also be spraying a matte coat over the top anyway, so I wasn't worried. Highlights were added to the interior by simply dropping some white into the olive drab mix. This is technically bad practice and should be a light green tone instead, though again this wasn't a huge issue as it wouldn't be seen very well in the end anyway. It 
Interior details were painted with a variety of different colours, including leather brown and black. These were applied with a fine-tipped brush in order to avoid painting areas that are supposed to be the olive drab shade. I added a bit of variation to the black radio equipment here by dry brushing it with light grey. This is a very easy and effective technique that you can apply and despite its simplicity it can still produce some nice looking results. If I was being painstaking the individual dials would be painted here though again they would be hardly visible in the end so I didn't really bother. This wooden panel on the sidewall was then masked off and sprayed with Mr. Colour Sail Colour ready for a wooden texture to be applied later on. Micro set and sole were used to apply this pretty hefty instrument panel decal in order to help it conform to the surface details. Later on I'll use the same pair of chemicals in order to apply the main decals. A little bit more depth was given to the interior through the application of an oil wash, mixed with dark brown oil paint and white spirit. This was brushed along almost all major details, though of course it ended up seeping into all the corrugated crevices on the surface. This was roughly cleaned up with a white spirit dampened brush. Now onto that wood I talked about earlier. The wood grain effect was created entirely with oil paints based on the brilliant advice of fellow YouTuber LPJ Models, who has at this point actually released an excellent video guide on how to achieve this effect yourself. I'm still pretty trash at it, so check out this video if you want to see the expert at work. The general idea is to apply the oil paint onto the surface and then to manipulate it with a slightly damp brush until you achieve the effect you desire. This may include removing large amounts at a time, or simply by brushing it in a certain direction. Some further highlights were added to the rest of the interior surfaces using a light green mix of oil paint, dry rubbed in using a soft brush. It was then just a case of assembling all the large parts, including the fuselage halves and wings, before moving on to the engines and the cells.
All of the engine components were first painted with Tamiya X11 silver, which was a nice resistant base that could be painted and weathered on top of. It actually sprayed really nicely, though if you're going for a high sheen finish, I'd instead use an Alclad or Mr. Color product. The first colour to go down on the exhaust manifolds was a sort of mid-tone rust shade from Life Colour. It's an acrylic, so it could be simply thinned down with water. I originally bought these paints because of a night shift video, and I have to say they have really nice coverage properties while still providing a very smooth result. A lighter rust tone was then speckled on top, giving a starting level of depth and variation. This would then be followed up with a dark rust wash to darken the manifolds and make them appear more worn in. A basic Tamiya pin wash was then added to the engines themselves to bring out some of those nice cylinder details. I later dry rubbed some dark brown oil paint onto the tops of the engines just to break up the fairly uniform appearance in these areas. To make this sort of reflector in the bottom of one of the wings, I decided to make use of a Molotov chrome marker pen, just as a sort of experiment. It actually turned out looking really good, and it reflects everything perfectly. At some point, I'll probably try spraying this stuff just to see how it goes down. I had a bit of an issue when it came to the main canopy. It didn't fit quite right, allowing it to jiggle slightly back and forwards. The extent of this was just too much to pass off and move by. So in order to fix it, I would have preferred to use plastic card, though I didn't have any at this point, so instead I resorted to some wooden veneer, which did the job perfectly well. All I did was cut it into very thin strips, and then stuck it along the profile of the slot where the canopy glass sits, using super glue. Any gaps were then simply filled with Humbrol model putty, and this process was actually surprisingly easy as the profile of the fuselage at this point was fairly straight edged.
The primer that I used on this build was Mr. Colors Mr. Surfacer 1500 in grey. I love this stuff, it's easy to spray and produces a beautiful smooth surface on which to apply more colours. Some pretty questionable pre-shading was then applied along all of the rivet lines on the model. Despite taking ages and being a painter do, this was an essential step. When combined with some basic post-shading later on, it would help to break up the monotone paintwork on the large surfaces that this aircraft has, most predominantly on the wings. Mr. Color H67 was applied to the lower surfaces in order to achieve RLM65 as closely as possible. It was sprayed in thin layers at a time so as to not completely obscure the pre-shading that was painstakingly added previously. <laughs> Following an ordeal with the masking tape, the first upper surface colour was laid down, this being AK Real Colour RLM71, which I believe should have been the late war variant, though I accidentally used the early war version instead. This isn't a huge deal though, as they look pretty similar in the end anyway. This was the point at which I added some of that post shading that I mentioned earlier. The RLM71 shade was first lightened up and then sprayed in between the dark pre-shaded panel lines that ran along the rivets on all of the surfaces. This actually looks pretty nice in the end, giving some much needed tonal variation to the surface. Following even more masking, the darker RLM-71 was sprayed on to complete the base two-tone camo that this particular aircraft featured. Post shading was then repeated on this darker green colour. With the masking tape still on, this effect looks totally overkill, though once the tape comes off and I've done a bit of weathering, it gets massively toned down. Now, time for the most daunting part of the painting process, the desert sand squiggles. Now, it wasn't exactly easy, though it really wasn't as hard as I thought it would be. It was just really time consuming. I first outlined each section with an ultra thin line of desert sand, which I often needed to go over a few times to achieve the effect that I desired. Do bear in mind that I used a 0.15mm needle for this, which was pretty much essential in getting the accuracy that I wanted. Then it was just a case of gradually filling in the middle until complete.
As with the other two camo shades, the Desert Sand squiggles were carefully post-shaded with a tone lightened with the same sail colour that I used for various purposes earlier. After some careful masking, the white ID stripe towards the rear of the aircraft was carefully sprayed on using AK Real Color White, which actually turned out to be a very high quality option when it comes to spraying white tones. With the painting done, it was varnishing time. I actually decided to try out Mr. Colour's GX100 gloss this time around, as I've heard great things about the stuff and thought it'd be worth a shot, and I can confirm it's absolutely brilliant. The sheen it creates from just one layer is absolutely brilliant, and can't wait to spray it again on future models. As mentioned earlier, all decals were applied using the standard combination of micro set and sole. As you can imagine, it was a real pain getting them to conform perfectly to the model's corrugated surface. I found that I really had to push them down with a cotton bud and then roll it sideways in order to push out excess air and fluid. The decals themselves were actually really nice though, supplying both a good amount of flexibility and strength. They were also quite thin, which was a nice surprise. Following a coat of GX114 matte varnish, I started the weathering off with a homemade oil wash. This was mixed with about two parts thinner to one part paint, and applied with a sharp pointed brush. Any excess wash that didn't look too good was simply cleaned off or blended in with some white spirit, thanks to the beauty of oil paints over enamels. As you can imagine, accurately applying the wash onto corrugated areas was tricky to say the least. In the end, I simply had to spend a while blending it all in with white spirit until it looked somewhat respectable.
Oil streaking was then carried out in various places on the model to add more interest and variation. For this, I simply dry blended oil paint with a soft brush until the desired effect was achieved. In terms of the engine streaks, they could have probably been a bit darker, though they look alright overall. Removing the canopy masking tape is always a satisfying process, and I have to say this was quite a good one at that. This was definitely partly down to the wonderful clear parts that were supplied in the kit. From this point onwards it was simply a case of assembly. This includes the wings which were painted detached from the model as well as all the smaller details that I didn't want to damage earlier in the build. You'll notice that a circular aerial piece is missing from the roof of the aircraft and this is because it unfortunately snapped whilst being removed from the sprue and it was just far too difficult to save. Well, there you have it, the finished Junker in all of its 600mm wingspan glory. The kit had its ups and downs, most of the latter being caused by the obscure nature of the aircraft itself, though there were of course some problems with the kit here and there as well, the most prevalent of which being that canopy that didn't want to sit properly. Despite this, it was a very enjoyable build overall. I wouldn't particularly recommend it if you had a choice, as it required a lot of commitment and it's just so massive and hard to manoeuvre. Though if you are out to buy a JU-52 in 148th scale, this is your only option. Anyway, that's all I have time for today. Again, Archie if you're watching, I really hope you enjoyed that, and that you'll enjoy the model itself into the future. To the rest of you watching, leave a like if you enjoyed, and I hope to see you all next time. Bye!